So, guys, welcome to yet another se se <coughs> Sorry, I have a bit of a sore throat, just a little bit bad intro. Welcome to another session of Gozu Academy. Um, today, what we'll be doing is a uh, Counter-Strike theory that I sort of have invented myself. I haven't heard anyone else talk about it. Um, and uh, I think right now it's kind of like my favorite theory to explain because it uh, has a lot of use. And I think it's very eye-opening to a lot of people that I tell it to, which makes it even more interesting for me to actually um, tell it. Uh, this is a Counter-Strike theory I choose to call the Cone of Awareness. And um, the Cone of Awareness is basically just um, a theory to explain what you need to be aware of and at what times. Um, but it goes a little bit deeper because you can uh, expand and shrink the cone sort of at will um it is more of a mental thing about counter-strike than it is a mechanical or tactical thing um but to an extent it is a tactical thing as well and i think it's very appropriate for a um, session here at the gozu academy so let me just fix my nades um and basically what is the cone of awareness well the cone of awareness is what I choose to call it when you uh, go into a new area or you stay in your same area and um, you need to be basically aware of things. Like that's how simple I can put it. So when I'm standing here, for example, well, likely I'm here at the start of a round. So the cone of awareness that I have right now is basically this area. Like the CT can now be peeking me from this area but it's very unlikely that after 10 seconds of the round, he comes from behind because this is simply just not possible. This means my cone of awareness right now is um, very few degrees of my field of vision. And ideally, you want your cone of awareness to be as small as absolutely possible. Because if you can imagine a, a sort of perfect scenario where the, the cone of awareness I need is just one thin line, this basically means... The only possibility for the CT is to peek me exactly in this one line. Now, the cone expands and shrinks as you move around the map. And I will be showing this on the radar so that it's even more clear later. But just for the sake of now, I will show it like this. As I'm going out A, when I'm here, my cone is from here to here. When I go further out, now my cone is from here to here. When I go further out, okay, now it's firebox. Well, he can peek me firebox, but he can also peek me stars, meaning that the area of which I need to be aware is this. Still not from behind, but just here to here. The further out I go, the bigger my cone of awareness. Now he can be here, he can be here, he can be here, up here, 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 and swing here. Um, ideally, you want your cone of awareness to be as small as possible, what I just said. Um, and if I draw a little bit on the map, you can imagine uh, when I was standing here, my cone of awareness looked like this, very narrow cone. Uh, this was all the area that I needed to be aware of. But as soon as I moved out here, my cone maybe looked more like this. And this is obviously a much bigger area that I need to be aware of where someone can push. Um, the reason why this is important is because you ideally want to give yourself a duel where you need to move your crosshair as little as possible when uh, the CT is peeking you. So imagine that uh, we have someone standing here and he is holding his crosshair this way to default and then someone swings theirs. Well, how likely is it that he, like the, the T here is going to win this duel? I would say quite unlikely. But instead, if we are standing here, like I mentioned earlier, and the cone of awareness is extremely narrow, well, there won't be many other positions to hold than stairs. And even if we are holding stairs and the guy swings from under stairs, the flick that we have to do, the sort of distance we have to move our crosshair across the screen is so small that we still have a chance. Um, 
The reason why the cone of awareness is, in my opinion, a little bit interesting to talk about is because you can expand on it with tactics. So let's say I'm coming out here and I am doing a stair smoke and I am doing the bench smoke. And as I'm coming out here, I in fact also do, uh, yeah, this is the, the old stair smoke. I actually don't really know a consistent lineup for the new one, but basically, uh, let me in fact just do this. I think if I let it more over here, it should be better. Okay, we'll work with this for now. But so long as these smokes are up and I'm almost off here, well, even though I am putting myself in a position where I'm open to more area, I basically don't need my cone of awareness to touch these smokes at all. Chances are no one is going to run through the smoke and chances are no one's going to run through the smoke into a Molotov. This, uh, because of this utility, I've now shrunk down my cone of awareness from here to here to just here to here, which are duels that are all quite winnable. Um, if I'm holding CT and he picks me default, I can click. If I'm holding CT and he's picking right side firebox, I can click. But if I'm holding CT and he's picking me stars, like the, the distance I will have to flick is so big that I will be at a um, disadvantage. And going on the radar once more, as you can see now, we have the smokes up. Imagine a Molotov laying here just to be able to visualize it a little bit better. In the event we have someone standing here, well, now our cone only needs to be like this, simply because we have uh, been able to disregard an area by using util effectively, basically. Um, and even though people don't realize it, this is sort of how you use utility. Um, obviously with flashes, it can be a little bit different, but with smokes and molotovs, it's typically to block off an area either from pushes or visually. And by blocking off things visually and, uh, making CT scared to push a smoke, like for example, pushing a stair smoke and jumping down into sandwich, um, is something that could happen, but is very unlikely to happen. And it's more something that probably as a T you keep your cone of awareness like this. And if someone should come through the smoke on your screen, well, now you can still see it in the corner of your screen and he won't be able to kill you, but you can kill him afterwards, for example. So without people really knowing, uh, exactly why they use utility, it can sort of be described. Uh, with the cone of awareness, you use smokes to visually block off an area so that your cone of awareness can shrink and use Molotovs to stop people from pushing so you can shrink your cone of awareness. This is obviously a super simplified, uh, I guess, theory. And it also is one where um, it sort of assumes a little bit that the whole game revolves around the cone of awareness. Um, obviously, there's much more to Counter-Strike than just this cone of awareness, but it is just a really good way to explain to uh, good players, but also new players, what you kind of need to be aware of and why. And um, something that I recently realized when I explained this cone of awareness to um, someone else, let me just restart one more time, is that the cone of awareness can be um, sort of specific to teams as well. Like the way I described it is that if we have a smoke stairs and we have bench smoke and we have Molotov here, <coughs> the same example that we um, had before. Well, if we are playing against prime Astralis, it's very unlikely that um, someone like device who is playing here with all will jump through the, the stair smoke and jump sandwich with an orb. This is like happening zero out of 100 rounds. But if you are playing against uh, a team of Russian face it grinders, uh, who like where all they do is push smokes and that's how they win rounds, like they take timings and these kind of things. Well, then maybe your cone of awareness actually still sort of needs to be on the smoke simply because this is still an option for them. Um, 
I think I will try real quick to uh, see if I can. Hmm. It might be a little bit hard on my video program. Uh, I, I'm actually going to try real quick. I will end my stream and I will go uh, on a specific website for, because it's easier for me to draw on. Um, so let me fix the stream and let me just uh, go here real quick. Um, so basically, uh, if we have the map of Mirage, I will just go over to it. If we have this, uh, like these double smokes that we talked about, and a Molotov here, uh, now it's maybe more easy to see it visually. Uh, there is no chance that a uh, device who is sitting here is jumping through with AWP and going sandwich and trying to get a multi-kill. This happens zero out of 100 times. But if you're playing against uh, Russian players who, who grind a lot of faces and, and the likes, well, it could happen maybe, let's say, five out of 100 times. Uh, that someone maybe pushes the smoke on bench into the molo to just try and get two kills out of nothing or jumping through the smoke going sandwich, um, these kind of things. And in this moment, well, you kind of still need the cone of awareness to be very uh, wide because you just need to be expecting more plays. Um, one of the best ways I can kind of explain the cone of awareness um, differently is overpass. I will first do it on this uh, CSGO board, and then afterwards I will uh, show it in game. Uh, yes. Um, so basically, I have a theory that, yeah, this is a, this is a sort of different theory I, that I have, that bad players will uh, tend to trend towards what is easy. So when players are T on overpass, if we don't smoke the monster pipe, well then what players are going to do is they are going to contact out monster and just take the fight. The reason why this feels easy and comfortable is because the cone of awareness when you come out of monster is very small. And as you are taking each new duel, the cone of awareness will only expand, like, uh, expand to one angle at a time. Like, you, you have to still be aware of the right side, obviously, until you've cleared it. And then when you move out, well, now you only need to worry about the player barrels. Then you can take the next angle. Okay, now we clear pillar. Okay, he's not there. Now we move out, and now it's the other side of pillar and water. Um, the reason why this works the way it does is because everything that happens when you walk out of monster is... Um, basically something that happens in your field of view and uh just going back to counter-strike 2 for a moment um if i try to go to all pass i can probably more easily explain this part on a server um but basically the theory i have is that when you play against sort of bad players people who are not professional that's basically it um uh, not saying that everyone who's not a professional is a bad player but typically the people who play face it since there isn't a lot of, uh, how can I say, um, awareness. Yeah, uh, I guess kind of also awareness, but also because, uh, for example, if you play a uh, competitive Counter Strike match, it's possible that someone will be watching your demo. So you need to be good at changing up what you're doing in your play. You can't do the same thing uh, ten matches in a row. But in face it, because every match is sort of in a vacuum and every match is its own match, you could potentially get really high elo by doing the same thing over and over again. You never have to uh, change your playstyle unless the opponents do something that forces you to adapt. Like, if my opponents don't smoke a uh, monster, well, I can go out and take this duel. And if I'm super comfortable doing this, well, I can do it the next match and the next match and the next match. Because the CTs won't learn anything over time. They won't know how I'm playing before the match starts, and they will have to figure it out as they go along. This is different from league play, where people have access to demos and uh, have time to prep. And so, so for people who have played in teams and played in leagues, they are typically more adaptable because um, they have been used to playing in a pattern less, I guess. 
Um, that's why for a lot of facet grinders, this monster thing that I explained, like you go, you check this, okay, it's not here. You go clear right side. As soon as this is done, okay, now we can disregard right side. We check one angle, we check another angle, we check another angle, and you can go and check angles one by one. And obviously your cone of awareness will still be this line over to here, because barrels could peak on a timing. But you basically only have to peak angles one at a time, and everything that will happen right now is in my field of view. This is why in a previous video I've made called uh, face a cheat code overpass. I recommend watching it if you want to get better at overpass. What I'm saying is that one of the best things you can do as CT on overpass is keeping monster smoke. Because if you take away what is very easy for the T's, well, they have to adapt and come up with something that is more complex. Um, let's say I smoked a monster and we keep monster smoke the entire round. Well, now they will never be able to contact our monster. So for them to be able to go out monster, now they will have to do the nose flash or they have to do a flash over. Um, these are already things that, while it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, that it's more complex to have someone flash while you go out than just going out. It, it sounds very simple, and I guess everyone here would agree with me as well. That it is basically just one more um, like parameter, one more thing that you need to think about. But the more you can make your opponents think, the more difficult you will make their play. Um, I don't think I've t told this in a Gozo uh, session before, but uh, yeah, I, I I got some like kind of professional poker coaching at some point, and I was I was reading this uh, poker book. Um, by a poker player called like uh, Daniel Negreanu. I think he's one of like the best. Uh, I'm not so into poker, but anyway, I read the book. And what it said in his book was um, that the best thing an amateur can do against a pro is just going all in on every single hand. Because by going all in on every single hand, you make it so that the professional poker player who you are playing against only has basically two options and he only has to make one decision so the one option is fold where he just says okay i just assume you have good cards and i just whatever and the other one is he can call and if he calls well then the game turns into a game of chance there are no more decisions to be made and so the amateur is forcing the professional to make a decision with very little information and he makes the game be just one decision. If you think of CS a little bit the same as poker in this scenario, an amateur will always be trying to go all in, which is just, for example, a contact play out monster. This is something where he will now either win his duel or lose his duel, but there isn't very much thought to it. It's very simple. And the amateur in this case, or the low elo player or whatever, will probably be able to contact out monster in a pretty solid way but if i as let's just say the professional in this scenario i smoke monster uh, it's pretty bad monster smoke let's let's do one that actually looks a little bit proper um if i as the professional smoke monster well now it's harder for the uh, amateur to go all in in this scenario now you force the amateur to instead of making one decision which is do i go or do i not go you force him to say, do I want to go through the smoke or not through the smoke? And then, okay, I want to go through the smoke, but now I need a flash from a teammate. Then he has to do more work and it just becomes more complex. If you can force your opponents, especially in pugs, to play a more complex brand of Counter-Strike, you have a much higher win percentage because one, with what I mentioned earlier, how people are typically playing in patterns in pugs, if you are able to break their pattern, you take them out of their comfort zone and you force them to adapt. And if they are good players, they might be able to adapt. But in the event that they are amateurs or not that good players, they are just typically used to playing in patterns uh, and doing the same things over and over. Um, what would be another solution for the T? Well, if he doesn't want to include a teammate, 
then he instead could go out short. And I've been building to this, but this is really when the cone of awareness comes into play. When you go short, well, when you peak the first angle, your cone of awareness is very narrow. When you peak the second angle, your cone of awareness is still very narrow. When you peak this, well, it's still all in your field of view. But as you are moving further and further out short, now you're peaking this. And now you open yourself up to an angle you actually haven't cleared while you are peaking another angle. So you are peaking two angles at once, which we never really had much of on Monster. Then it gets even worse the further you go. Maybe someone can be sitting here. Maybe someone can be heaven. And now, as you can see, I'm playing 4x3. It could be different if you're a full HD player. But as I'm holding heaven now, there are angles that can peek me outside of my field of view. And obviously, as we go even further, this gets worse and worse to the point where at some point I have to turn my back on something to get out here. That's why for a lot of players it's very comfortable for them to contact out monster and it feels nice. Because you can do it alone and just take the duel. But contacting out short almost never happens because there is so much that can go wrong. Like no matter where you're, you're looking, like if I want to peek this angle, well now the guy can be standing on this very common off angle and potentially uh, killing me here. Um, this is where the cone of awareness, in my opinion, is a really good way of uh, explaining why some things seem easy to do and some things seem hard to do. Got a question if you don't mind? Yeah, of course, of course. So, I understand what you're saying here, right? Mm -hmm. But I also feel like when you're going through monster compared through um, construction or short, mm -hmm. that it's more like a death trap when you're going through monster because it's one little hole and you're trying to get through there. Whereas when you go through short, you it's easier to throw like the bridge smoke, right? That blocks mm -hmm. off um, between the site and maybe another one by pillar. You can throw that from water. It's hard to throw any utility that gives you uh, any kind of cover to fight really from monster. So I mean, so I don't know if that plays a factor in, in a sense like, you know, in terms of what you're talking about, like in terms mm -hmm. of how monster is easier because of the fact that, you know, this cone awareness is a little more narrow. Mm -hmm. um, whereas you can kind of make your cone awareness a little bit more narrow for the use of utilities on short, on short, but you, it's a lot harder to do on monster. Yeah. Um, I get that argument, but what kind of utility would you need on Monster? No, but that's my point. Like, I feel like it's harder to throw utilities. The The way that the, the map is designed, you can't, it's hard to throw smoke over or anything of that. You know, like the bridge blocks it. I mean, it's really <laughs> difficult to throw utilities over other than maybe a flash. You know what I mean? Oh, so you mean when we are all the way out of Monster, then we have a worse situation. Is that what you mean? <laughs> Well, I'm saying that, okay, once you, okay, let's say you do push through monster, right? Mm -hmm. There's, it's really hard to throw utilities here, smokes or anything yeah. that kind of help you, right? Mm -hmm. Where, in other words, you could throw it once you're on the site, but you don't, but you have to, you have to switch from a or weapon to a utility, which means you're unarmed while you're trying to throw it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to throw it, whereas on short, right, you could throw that in water, right? There's multiple ways to throw in smokes and utilities because the bridge doesn't block everything. There's a lot more space overhead. Throw mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. right? So my question is, um, doesn't that kind of take away? Doesn't that take away some of the disadvantages in a sense? Because like you could throw a smoke on bridge, like I said, right, right from water, right? You can mm -hmm. throw one probably from water also that blocks off. Yeah, the one that goes there, you can like put, here. throw another one. Yep, one there. You could throw another one by the pillar, let's say, right? And then now your your cone of awareness is a lot more smaller than it would be if you were trying to push for monster see what i mean um yes i kind of do see what you mean but i also think that maybe the sort of red herring with with this uh what you mentioned or like your argument is that i think also the reason why you bring this up is because there is just a much bigger need for utility when you're coming from short like this is just um, not so something it's, it's you like do. It's like adding complexity. It's adding more complexity. Exactly. Okay, got it. Yeah. All right. So like, 
ex I completely agree with you. A lot of utility is is easier to throw from a uh, short like this, this this bridge smoke. I don't even have a lineup for it because I don't really use it anymore. It's like a little bit off meta, but I remember it being like quite easy to throw by hand, which I'm proving right now. Um, XD, but I feel you kind of need some utility. Like let's say you're going from short. If you don't have a heaven smoke, going out here just sucks but from monster like you can just decide your pathing better so you are not visible to heaven at all and i think it's like yeah on short it's easier to throw the uto but it's also a must that you throw the uto and that's as you said it it adds complexity um i also think like there is basically not a single piece of utility that you can throw from short you can't throw from outside monster except maybe like this molotov but it is not really one that's that like that often used i don't have a lineup for this because like the bridge smoke here because um i don't know i don't it's not really meta anymore but i know back in the day you yeah I, okay i just like kind of <laughs> did it on feeling but you could throw this if you feel like you absolutely need a bridge smoke um, I think also when you come out monster, you can typically like peek this, peek this, peek this, and then you can just uh, do a smoke mid side. This will give you so much space to move, like, and you you eliminate like uh, water, you eliminate heaven, you give yourself more space to play. There are some options, but I think the I, I think your question is great. By the way, I just want to say that I think it's a really fucking good question, um, but I think you are getting also a little bit fooled by the fact that you just feel like when you go short, you need to use util because you you have to. Otherwise, if you don't have a bridge smoke or if you don't have a heaven smoke, just you just will never contact out here. It just doesn't happen because it's harder. Like, there's so well, much yeah, that can go you were, Yeah, because you were saying that you have to peek both directions. That's why I was bringing mm -hmm. up the smokes. Like, you have to kind of smoke off one side, cover your back in yeah. order to peek one side, you know? And then if if... If the idea is okay, but then now I don't have this lineup perfectly, or whatever. But let's say we need to smoke a bridge to make this out. Well, then it's already adding an extra layer, right? What I kind of said earlier. Yep. Now yep. we have to know a lineup. Now we have to throw this, and then okay. But if the smoke pops, then maybe the CTs will rotate from A early, which puts us in a worse spot in B. And all of a sudden, more and more thoughts start. Like there's more decisions being made, more thoughts being had. And this is all something where the pro or the better player will have an advantage. Um, it's why you see uh, a team like the old uh, Cloud9, basically, like the, the Gambit roster with Nephany and stuff. They were famous for playing a lot of defaults. And it was quite interesting, actually, because I think a default favors the team that, ha like the team that has more experience most of the time. Because... Uh, a default relies more on individual decision making and the team with more experience sh should uh, ideally have better individual decision making um, that is why a lot of teams who uh, have an era almost all of them like navi astralis um, sk they have like a system where they obviously have some tactics to fall back on but the majority of their game is made up of defaults where they feel out the map and use the experience and teamwork and sort of the reactions that they've discussed to win rounds more so than like a, a snappy's ends, for example, where they are known for being very execute heavy, um, which is also a good style of play, but is also probably part of the reason why we hail snappy for getting so much out of sort of lesser players. It's because his system works without that much individual decision making you can have relatively bad players uh, compared to other top pros uh, and put them in a system that works for them but uh, they don't have to have insane individual decision making they just need to have good mechanics basically so that they at least will take the kills when they need to uh, that's why i think someone like Sphinx, who individual decision making is not what he's famous for someone like nats I would say the same. It's definitely much more aim heavy. Um, someone like Madden. I mean, he's good in his role, don't get me wrong, but he's just not famous for having an insane read of the game. He is famous for having good mechanics. Um, and 
yeah, I guess I'm getting a little bit off track now. My point is just that um, by doing this one smoke as a CT, I'm forcing the T's to change what they are doing. And by forcing them to change what they're doing, I'm putting them out of their comfort zone, one. But also, if they still want to keep the decisions to a minimum, because they are just not that good at, let's say, team play, because they as players are not that good, they will be forced to do things that are worse, like just objectively worse. Walking out short alone, contacting, is just not as good of a play as contacting out monster and taking duels alone. Um, and when we think about sort of what util teams will do before they hit monster, um, like, let me see if I can if I can hit this bad boy now. Supposed to take this corner, but anyway, um, if you land like the heaven smoke, or well, most teams will go with like a heaven smoke, and then they will go with like a with like a barrels molotov, and this is um, we can add the or like use the cone of awareness as part of the theory that when we clear this with barrels molotov, we even further can reduce the cone because or like shrink the cone because when we peak this and then peak this. This is no longer an option, so the cone becomes here and until here. And that is why, you know, using a barrels model can be really effective, because we can disregard this area and we can shrink the cone. Does does this make sense? What I'm like, does the cone of awareness make sense to people? I don't know if you can hear me, but at least for me it yep. makes a lot of sense. Okay. Good. I mean, it, it it reminds me a little bit of slicing. I don't know if you've heard of that term. No, no. Uh, maybe, it, maybe maybe it's more of a term in America, but slicing is a way of how you peak, right? Mm -hmm. Where you only want to peak a slice at a time. If you think like a pizza, right? yeah, you slice, yeah. cut it into slices. Oh yeah. You kind yeah. of want it. You only you only want to peak a little slice at a time so that you're never opening yourself to too big of a risk. Like you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's yeah. what you're doing right now. Yeah. You're slicing, right? Yeah. And that's actually a real world uh, tactic in, in you know when you think of special forces mm -hmm. you think with the military SWAT they call it pieing same thing like same okay. concept so so yeah. it does definitely does resonate yeah cool that's really cool like uh, yeah that's not something I I've ever heard before but that's definitely something I will add to my memory bank because that's also a really interesting way I mean essentially uh, a pizza slice is a cone like the, it, it has the cone shape if you imagine the sort of uh, non crusty part of the pizza is the the start of the player's vision like that's that's exactly the neck cone right so it kind of works to explain the same um, and uh, this is just something you can apply to all maps I'm thinking now I was just go through some of the maps like something like let's say all pass a side you know, the common utility is something like this, and you do Molotov truck, and then you do a flash. But you can't really use the cone of awareness that well to just explain why you do this execute. You do it to eliminate areas more than anything. This is just a bombsite that when you hit it, you will typically be jumping up here with a flash and just coming in here and like kind of having to clear a lot of stuff. Um, it's not every map where you can just say, oh, they do this piece of utility because of the cone of awareness or something like this. Um, but there are definitely some maps and, and more specifically maps where there is one very clear opening. Like one, I think probably the last map that I want to go through here with, uh, with the cone of awareness is Anubis. Because uh, I think this is also a really good map for exactly understanding uh, the cone of awareness. Um, oh, can I add that one yeah. of the best maps that you might want to look at is maybe Nuke Bombsite B. Um, because one of the cool things about it is like if you if you peek just through single door and double door, you can mm -hmm. kind of clear and see about eighty to ninety percent of the whole map without even going in. I'm not counting like the top level, but just mm -hmm. on the bottom level you can clear 90 percent of the map without even going it um through the doors yet mm -hmm. just from the cone just from like you know like you're saying that the cones of awareness 
just from what you can see through single versus what you can see through double. Mm -hmm. That that makes sense as well. I think, uh, I mean, it's a... Uh, I get what you mean, um, but I think it's kind of a, a bad example for the corner of awareness exactly because anywhere where you go out of single or or double, I mean, single, you you have a pretty tight tight core, but for double, you will almost always be opening up yourself to multiple angles as you're going out. Um, single as well, but in a little bit of a different way. You can kind of do the pieing or the slicing like you're talking about. Um, I'm thinking with the cone of awareness, more the maps that require a little less teamwork, and they are more like puck heavy, and it's typically because um, you can do a lot alone. Like uh, Anubis A side, for example, is in some regards quite similar to Opas in that you peak this angle, you peak this angle, then you move out, but someone could be barrels basically, and then you peak like this, like maybe you peak this first, you peak this, then you peak the inside of side, and then you come out and then you peak broken wall, and then you peak uh, like camera, and then you peak close lift. You can take the angles one at a time, and it's really good to explain the cone of awareness. Um, and it also explains... Is that, why is that why people always love to go banana on Inferno? Because they feel like they have that same sort of advantage that you're talking about right now with the cone of awareness? Yes, that's why people in Pox tend oh. to heavily favor banana, because everything that you're going to be doing is happening in your field of view. You will never go out in a situation like here where you're going out like this and you open yourself up to like pillar and camera while looking heaven. This this will not happen on Anubis A side. It can't happen. And the same as your example is really good with Infernal Banana. It's so narrow that the cone will always be narrow. That's why it's like kind of an Amos paradise because if you are a good aimer, well, you just need to do very small adjustments. Um, and to some extent, it's a little bit the same on Anubis B side in that you can also peak angles very one at a time. Like you can really jiggle everything and even check like this and check like that and check this. Like it's, it's typically, uh, a pretty good indicator that you're playing an easier map to pug on if everything like every piece of space you need to take is happening in your field of view coming mid everything is happening in my field of view even here i can still always see this now i check this okay i can come out and now as i'm coming out here i can check angles everything is in my field of view i'm coming out here i check this maybe and then again field of view um i even actually Almost always, if I'm not getting fought here in mid at all, I will come and spam this door because it's very spammable. So I don't even need to clear this. I just know it's clear. And you can, again, everything is in your field of view, which makes Anubis, again, a pretty aim-heavy map. Even the CT duels, talking about Cone of Awareness, the cone is quite narrow here. In mid, the cone is quite narrow. On A, I mean, the cone here is narrow. The cone here is narrow, like on B as well. The cone here, very narrow. Um, this is why I like to use the cone of awareness to kind of make people understand why it is so, why it feels so good to take contact space in some areas and why it doesn't in others. Um, something that is kind of not official and might not ever be. Uh, I have been coaching a team uh, like lately. Um, just only two days, but we had a uh, practice against um, some very young Danish players and they were doing the most insane stuff known to man. We were playing uh, Vertigo and it would be like on B they would just jump down B-Lobby all the time. On A they would be pushing all of uh, their own smokes almost and they would just be playing full crazy and at the beginning it caught us off guard until at some point I mentioned, uh, like I said, take a pause. And I explained this concept of the cone of awareness. And what I told my players is that um, even though you, let's say, smoke left side side here. And you feel like, okay, now my cone of awareness is here and, and here and here, right? As I'm going out, like my cone is this. 
this is the sort of normal scenario if you're playing against a team of of veterans or um you know typical scandinavian counter-strike is like very team play heavy counter-strike but if you're playing against again russian face it grinders or very young players like who rely more on mechanical skill than maybe team play and are taking more risk and jumping through more smokes well maybe even though you use this smoke you still always have to be a little bit aware of the smoke so that instead of the two first players going in and both looking this way maybe the first person is walking in like this and the second person is just standing in a way where it's easier to react on this smoke or standing anti-flash because okay i think that they're going to pop through the smoke so if i hear a flash boom then i turn and then i kill um, and as soon as I told my players, try to just play a round where no matter what happens, no matter what utility you have down, no matter the situation, your cone of awareness is always 360 degrees. Like, even just think someone could kind of be in my back right now. Like, if there is actually a timing for this, just think, okay, he could be behind me now. And as soon as we changed our mindset to... Uh, being ready for anything. One thing that happened was that we slowed down our play a lot and we actually countered the aggressive moves much better because we didn't take anything for granted. Like we didn't ever get caught with a grenade out in our hands while someone randomly pushed a smoke or something. We were keeping our guns out more and uh, just overall we were playing as if we were in control much more. But if we played against big or something like this these very um sort of uh, in a way predictable sort of tier one teams well then if we smoke here left side there is almost zero percent chance someone is coming through here and we can play these areas a little bit faster and peak where it makes sense for them to be now what this also led to is that we started even more talking about the cone of awareness, and this was what I also thought was pretty cool, is that um, the cone of awareness as a theory allows you to have um, a narrow cone while aggressive, a uh, wide cone while aggressive, narrow cone while defensive, and also uh, a wide cone while defensive. So these players that we played against we figured out that from these four options well what would be best for us was a, a wide cone while defensive the reason why this made sense was because they were making a lot of aggressive moves um, at random timings so us staying a little bit more back but having like widening our mental cone basically just being more ready for anything allowed us to kill them when they did these aggressive moves. But you could also have a situation where, um, for example, overpass A site, like I mentioned, is a place where, okay, you're running in on A, and as you're coming in, there is like this space and right side and left side you have to clear. Like imagine we don't have Molo for this, and now we want to do a B-pop. Well, it means as I'm standing here waiting for the flash, Maybe I take knife, I jump in, I check this, I check that, and then I, I run and clear this. This is an extremely wide cone while I'm playing aggressively. But it could also be something like in mid, where I can be running forward in mid, but my cone is narrow. Like, I almost everything is happening in my field of view, but I am, I am still aggressive. And so, sort of understanding what, what cone and what tempo you should have is a very basic uh, or like very simplified version of understanding when to do what in Counter-Strike. Like different cones might be useful at different times and different rounds on different areas. But also some of these will be uh, like kind of team specific. If we are playing against, uh, I don't know, playing against Virtus Pro, which is a notoriously slow playing team that I always use as my example, 
may be playing a narrow cone while aggressive, a CT is something we have to do because um, we know that they are waiting. And at some point, we are going to have to play aggressive. So I'm going to go close here while my teammate is flashing through the, the window. And this is around 40 seconds. They are about to line up for an A execute. I swing out, I kill. And as you can see, my cone here is quite narrow. This is narrow, 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 narrow. Everything is in my field of view, but I'm playing aggressively. It could then be we have a white cone while aggressive. Okay, maybe um, we play against a team that stacks a lot. That could actually also be versus pro, but now we are on T side. Well, then it means that as I'm coming into the A side and we do an A execute, well, maybe I have to clear this, but then still check pillar and like uh, my cone needs to be wide while I'm playing aggressively and so on and so on. You can make examples for everything, but um, this is something I think even some of the lower tier professional teams don't understand well enough is um, again this adapting, but sort of adapting your play style to your opponents. Um, there's a big difference between playing a team like Big, who are just very trying to play by the book, or playing against, uh, uh, I don't know who I can even use right now, um, but I would almost always say like a Russian team, someone like Aurora maybe. I don't think they have like a lot of set executes and I don't think their players are playing a lot on um, amazing teamwork. They are playing more on one guy doing an aggressive move that maybe gets a kill and then because of that another guy takes a timing and stuff like this. Um, you have to, to adapt your team's playstyle to the opponents that you are facing. And I feel the cone of awareness is a really good way of doing this because you can use it to explain um, very simply what you're doing. Um, it's a tool basically for an IGL to be playing a match and instead of saying, uh, guys, play de defensive, don't give entry. Well, playing defensively on T-side, for example, isn't necessarily the right choice, but being able to say something like, guys, we need to play default because it should be working but we need to widen our cone of awareness. And as long as you have talked about this with your team, this allows you to play a default, but a more careful default. Without people playing like pussies, they are still going to keep their normal roles. They are just going to do it in a way where they are just constantly expecting something to happen. And I think that's the beauty of the cone of awareness is that um, you can very easily use it to explain exactly what you want your teammates to do and it in fact also um, helps explain i've had times in my career when i've been playing 100 120 hours uh, per two weeks and as i am getting more and more sort of burned out or or my brain is getting a little bit fried from all the playing well i will naturally be less aware I'm just less focused on my crosshair, maybe less focused on what's going to happen. And I'm playing more on like autopilot. I'm playing more on feeling. Well, maybe that is a time when I need to understand, okay, I need to widen my cone of awareness. Um, or maybe uh, I am playing sort of too carefully against the team, which never do anything aggressively uh, as CT. Like I'm T, I'm playing against a team who never do any moves, but there is no reason for my cone to be expecting a push here and expecting a push here at the same time. I can focus a little bit more on my crosser, which gives me maybe more um, strength in my duel, basically. So yeah, guys, I think that was what I wanted to say about the cone of awareness. So now it is time for questions and it's also time for yeah, any comments or any thoughts people have? I have a question. Um, so if you're in a situation like you just described, that you don't have your full focus or the situation that I'm usually in, I, I know I don't have good reactions, good flick shots. So if something happens like 45 degree away from my crosshair, I will probably lose the duel anyways, right? Mm -hmm. Um should I not, for the sake of focus, 
keep a smaller cone of awareness than I maybe should, going by this theory. Yes. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, at least, I guess the way I would explain it, if I understand your question correct, is that um, someone like Nico is extremely good at playing Inferno Banana because he has a very low sensitivity. And for someone who has a, a very low sensitivity, uh, typically a narrow cone of awareness, like if you can play in a way where you give yourself a narrow cone of awareness, you will um, be better. Like, it's why a lot of low sensitivity players um, that are the best, like BlameF, uh, Rops, to some extent Nico, like Nico is a pretty aggressive player, but he's doing it, he's a very, let's call it a very controlled entry. Um, these are all players who play quite a low sensitivity, and they play so tactically smart and not putting themselves at that much risk. I know Nico is not the same as BlameF and Rops, but let's say BlameF and Rops, uh, as my example here, they are lower sensitivity players, and their strength lies in having a narrow cone because small adjustments are very precise when you play low sensitivity, whereas if you are playing, uh, let's say, Voxic sensitivity, doing just a small adjustment from here to here might be almost as difficult as doing a, an adjustment from here to here or here to here because you just naturally are used to big movements. And the strength in low sensitivity is that you can aim very precisely and the strength in high sensitivity is you can um, move your crosshair very quickly. So that's also why we have a tendency to see players who play a high sensitivity to have a more uh, aggressive nature, like uh, Surson, for example. Um, he is a very aggressive AWP player, uh, plays very high sensitivity, uh, simple uh, and notoriously uh, aggressive player, um, where even if he's running in here and he's... Uh, clearing here but then he gets peaked from tempo he still has the chance to flick and and even though he might not have the precision that a low sense player will he might have just enough precision combined with speed that he will still get the kill uh, maybe not by headshot but then by by spraying down the opponent faster than uh, simple can get sprayed down if that makes sense so i think what you say makes sense if you feel like you are not good at big adjustments, then narrowing your cone or playing in a way where you narrow your cone down makes a lot of sense. And this is something you can have control over in a match by, for example, instead of wanting to contact in and just take a fight, maybe you do you get better with utility. You use this smoke, you use this Molotov, you bounce a random flash above here, and now you go in and everything is like very small cone. Uh, stuff. Does that answer your question? Uh, uh, no, actually not. <laughs> okay. I mean, that, 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 that all makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I was more aiming at, like, uh, let's say you don't have any monades, um, you're swinging mm -hmm. out uh, A-side Mirage or anything, and mm -hmm. you've cleared stairs, but now you have to focus on CT. Um, mm -hmm. What I'm saying is, you have the actual cone still big, but you are focusing your attention only on mm -hmm. the narrower cone to improve your probability of making uh, of winning the probable fight, mm -hmm. while accepting that you will you will lose you will definitely lose the improbable fight. Mm -hmm. So, just to make sure I'm fully understanding, you're talking sort of about still having a very wide cone with the space that you're going into, but sort of disregarding part of the cone, just saying, "Fuck it, yeah. if I die from here, I die from here." Yeah, yeah? To, in to increase like the probability of winning the probable fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like, uh, yeah, Anubis doesn't have that good of an example, but it would be something like, okay, instead of looking uh, left side, I will just focus my attention running here because if he's here, I will definitely kill him. And if he's on my left side, okay, then I will die. But it I'm risking uh, because I feel like I have a read. Is it, is yeah, it or, or you already cleared it, and you you're basically just risking the re peak, like somebody hiding mm. and peeking late. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. No, I get you completely. Um, I think also this is sort of a, uh, it kind of is a, a sort of low and high sense debate. Like for example, um, just for the sake of this, 
let's say I'm a really low sensitivity player, or let's just say I'm like Nico. Uh, he's definitely on the lower side. When I'm pushing this with Mac 10, my crosshair placement will ver be very strong, and I will be looking like this maybe, and it looks very good, but this is sort of part of the advantage I have as a low sensitivity player is my crosshair placement will be probably uh, amazing, and my first bullet accuracy will also be amazing, but... Um, Okay, this is like a crazy example. If I, a CT, have an MP9, and I know there's a T on my left, and it, or like, there could be a T on my left, and there could be a T on my right, well, if I am a low sensitivity player, I cannot do this. You know, it, it's quite hard for me to gain any meaningful info from this, and killing, like, any of these guys before they kill me is very difficult with low sensitivity. So it kind of makes sense for me to disregard some of it and like focus one side clear this first and then go out here but instead if i'm playing martin sense who is like kind of the different kind of entry frag or maybe he is capable of doing this like and and seeing it fast enough and like just killing someone fast i don't know like high sensitivity allows you to um clear more corners as you are exploring space like you can you can you can just check more things. Um, whereas if you're a low sensitivity player, it will typically be more where you your crosshair will be fixated on one point for longer as you're moving. And that's kind of in a way uh, disregarding the like part of the cone. Like I'm I'm taking calculated risk as I'm running out here with low sense, whereas with high sense you're just more like a Beyblade, because your likelihood of hitting a a big flick is just um, not not necessarily higher, but the likelihood of you hitting the flick faster than the CT can kill you is more likely with a high sensitivity. Um, so yeah, I think what you said makes uh, sense. Um, but yeah, it is a little bit of a hard thing to talk about in a way i guess i hope it made sense what i said now and that it you feel you got your question answered yeah yeah thank you perfect perfect otherwise otherwise we go again um all right any other questions guys doesn't have to be about cone of awareness or anything this session by the way it's just like if you have a question now's the time I have another one if nobody has else has one mm -hmm. um yeah. like uh, maybe two yeah maybe one question with an example mm -hmm. um because yes the cone of awareness and managing that i i understand like where to keep my focus mm -hmm. um how do you because i think there's another thing um that is beyond the cone of awareness and that's the radar right and and what what your team's doing are um uh, what you what you would be able to see on the radar if you paid attention to it like where where people pop up in red and and people dying mm -hmm. and for example if you are short on overpass as we were before yeah. i'm always super freaked out about connector right um so i need to pay attention to is, is my connector player winning or losing because if he loses i immediately have a cone in my back yes um so how do you actively like or do you have like a like a routine uh on how to make sure that you pay enough attention to to to, to the radar basically um i i think that is also i guess part of like your example here um if your teammate is connector you don't you don't have the cone in the back as you said right because you expect your teammate to be killing the ct before he opens the door and kills you right yep um but i think it's just more so that uh, maybe less so with radar but i at least notice when someone dies in the top right corner and i can typically glance at it very quickly and identify if it's a blue or red color that is first so if i like my thoughts in this scenario you you thought up is um my teammate has my back unless he dies or tells me he doesn't have my back um for example if the ct smokes him off well now your cone probably needs to be in your back as well right um yeah. but 
in the event that I see something pop up in top right, like in my death notices, I will glance at it and see if it's a CT or a T that died first. And, or like, a, like got the kill. And if it's a T, well, then I can just relax because then I know no matter what, it can't be my guy. But then if it is um, a CT that got the kill, I will probably also quickly glance at like, uh, the name of the T, or maybe I even always do this. Like, I think I always glance up and I can even say something like, oh, you killed the AWP player, you know? Um, it's not something I do very consciously, but just I I notice when someone dies and that's realistically all you need to worry about. You don't really need to look at your radar um, at this moment, unless you have teammates going out monster at the same time that you want to time things with or something. If that makes yeah. sense. Uh can I say something that might help? Is um, I know I just noticed this like two days ago. So this is not even something that was in CS Go. Mm -hmm. Apparently, CS Two now lets you choose where you want the feed, the kill feed. Wait, what? Be. So it does not. Yeah. 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 So it does not. So it does not have to only be on your top right. You can actually change it so it's on a top, like top left. Like you can keep it by your radar. This way, you're able to keep track and you know glance at the radar in the same area. Yeah, it's under, um... Pretty sick. Let me check. Let me see if I can find, let me see if I can find it. Can I found it by accident? <laughs> and I was yeah, like, you can search like, as well this, maybe? Death I think it's kill. Is it a feed? Try looking feed. F-E-E-D. Yeah. Yep. That's not it. Where is it? I've seen it too. I haven't used it, but I've, I've, I've seen it somewhere, yeah. Yeah. That might actually be worth experimenting with. I've never tried that, but it kind yeah. of makes sense so, to have the death notice the same side as the, the same radar. place as your radar, right? Because then you're then you're looking at both things at the same time rather mm -hmm. than looking left, looking right, looking left, which I always thought was kind of like weird in a sense. And it will always center it more towards the middle of the screen as well, so it's easier to see the, the death notices. Because if it's like right now, for example, under my radar, well, it's more towards the middle height of my screen. And if it's to the right of my radar, because I don't know where it exactly goes, then uh, it will be more towards the the middle, like vertically, if that makes sense. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've also sort of stuck my radar basically to my crosshair now with the hut edge position thing. Oh, really? <laughs> just to just to make sure I look at it enough. Ah. Oh, there it is. It's called a community called the community notification location. It's under HUD. HUD. Click HUD. Uh, yes. this, and then this one. that one. Yep. See how it says top right? Yeah. And then you left. can change it. You oh, you can even the change the offset. What the fuck? That's sick. So if I. Can I add bots in this? I can. So if I kill. <laughs> but yeah, that's... now. That didn't somehow work for me. Wait, do you. Wait, is it. The heck? Maybe. It doesn't work because I need to rejoin the server or something like this. But I can try to just change the. This so one these, these settings usually work right away. Mm, apparently not for me right now, but uh, I will put it on top left, and probably tomorrow when I start playing, I'll be like, "What the hell?" <laughs> I think the community communication thing is the, is the stuff that popped up in the bottom left. That's not the kill feed. Oh, it's not. No, I think that's something different. Alright, we'll find it then. Mm. But yeah, uh, this is probably something I could figure out. I mean, if you, if you figure it out as well, I would actually like to know it. It sounds pretty fun, but um, yeah, maybe just in case someone has a question, uh, we should move on with that instead. Sure. But thank you. It's actually nice to know. Okay, no questions. Uh, I mean, still, if someone has something, you can bring it. I think I, I don't a follow, really... A follow-up yeah. to that. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. you can say, okay, I, I see, like, the kill feed, yeah, that should always trigger my attention, right? I should always mm -hmm. check, okay, what, what happened? Mm -hmm. uh, and look at the radar or, or, or know, the, know the people, but I usually pay pucks, so I don't know the people, and they won't announce where they died and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but apart from that, like... In a puck, I, I, I won't even know if somebody even goes connector. Like, I have to check that. <laughs> Otherwise, mm -hmm. I, I have to cover it. Um, so, uh, is there like, do, do you have an automat automatic, like, every five seconds you glance at it or, or, or something like that that you actively trained, or is it just passively you, you, you're basically aware? 
Mm, I think it is kind of passive awareness. Let me just go on an mm. overpass. Um, do you drive a car? Yes. I don't know. When I got taught to drive a car, uh, I was told that on average you should look in your rear view mirror uh, something like every, I don't know, eight seconds or something like this. And I mean, I don't stand by it religiously, but I do do it a lot. And it's kind of because in a way I feel blind without it. And to some extent, I feel the same in CS without my radar. Like my radar is an extremely important part of knowing where things are. Like uh, I have my radar zoomed much uh, like uh, zoomed out much more than most players. And it's just because I like to know what's going on everywhere in the map. Like if I'm short here now, I can see the entire map. Uh, even the people all the way deep on long, I can see exactly which side of long are they running on. If I see a red dot, I know exactly where he is. It means I'm not very zoomed, so it can sometimes be a little bit maybe hard to see. Uh, well, I don't really struggle with it, but uh, yeah, maybe more specifically how close my teammates are to shot, I don't know, uh, something like this. I don't have issues with it really, but I think what I would be doing in this uh, specific example you mentioned would be as I'm running here and I don't have anything to do anyway, I would be like glancing at my radar now and seeing if someone is going underground from my team. Mm -hmm. And if they are, then I know I can take short kind of safely. Like, and then now I'm just focusing cross out, let's say. And now as I get into like a safe position, maybe I just glance up now again. Then since you mentioned like you are trying to fight towards short, I would probably just have like now I would either know if my teammate is underground or if he isn't underground. And then if I see on a death notice that okay, my teammate died, um, I would yeah, maybe even glance up at the radar if I'm in some kind of decent position where I'm not like, I mean, if I'm out here, I will not look at my radar. But, but if I'm here where I'm holding an angle, I'll probably look at my radar real quick. And if I see there's my con player dying, then either I will fall back and I'll hold con. Or the other option is also that I make my move now you know like i yeah, use yeah. this wall to close the angle that he has and that could be the same as well sort of if i am already here i don't need to worry about underground anymore because like now i'm in the process of making my move right mm -hmm. um yeah so i guess i'll just use the radar to get a basic understanding of where my teammate went at the start of the round and if i see he went underground then I trust him to hold me. And if he then went down in underground and left it immediately, then he just bamboozled me. Like, that's yeah, then you know you're weird. The puck. Yes. Yeah, and also probably a lower elo one because, like, people will not waste time doing these kind of things. Like, it's stupid to go down here and without saying or doing anything, just being like, ah, you know what, I should just go up again. Like, that's, uh, yeah. Yeah, welcome to my life. Yeah. Well, I know how that that can be. I use the, I use the zoomed out radar because I have idiot teammates that never tell me when um, when they have the bomb. <laughs> so this is the only way I know that the bomb is dropped or even spotted. Yeah. Yeah, and you have it on follow player, right? I'm surprised to see that because if if you if you don't do that, you, you will always pretty much see the whole map. But in this case, you might at some. Oh, you point mean centered? Or... You mean centered? Yeah. 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 yeah, because... yeah. On overpass, it's it's not an issue, but right now, as you see, you don't see the whole map, almost. But uh, yeah. I changed that now, so so I always see the whole map. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't changed my radio settings in quite a while, actually. So I don't know why I, I have it like that, honestly. So, so yeah. So if you switch it to like set, not yeah, seal radar always or not. Yeah. Yeah. This way you see everything. Yeah, it's yeah. better, right? It is actually kind of better, but you do also have a little bit less focus on your area, I guess. I think at least it would be a little bit confusing for me at the start because I'm not center, so I will have to find myself. I it's not that, but it doesn't really make a difference because your 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 dot is so big. Yeah. Actually, actually, what confuses me is the what the fact that you have it rotating. The map rotating is what always confuses me. <laughs> oh no, yeah. I need that. Otherwise, I'm completely lost. No, because I'm because I'm always trying to figure out like, where where am I? Where is the other site? Mm -hmm. <laughs> where am I in relation to everything? Because I don't know the map has changed. Yeah, yeah, I guess you. Um, 
Yes. Guys. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry for cutting you a little bit short, but I'm just thinking also a little bit about the people watching this on YouTube who maybe don't care about death notices settings and radar settings and stuff. And uh, I think probably if there are no more questions, I will end the recording here and then I can um, get that uploaded. And then if you want to like sit and spend a few minutes discussing settings, then we can just do sure. that without a recording. Because, I mean, I'm learning things for sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know if... Uh, the average person who watches these YouTube videos will, will want to... Yeah, maybe they have already the settings they want. So, anyone got a, a final dying breath? Which is a question. Thanks. Okay, I'll give it like 30 seconds. And if no one has something... You don't have to come up with a question, but just if you have a question, then... You have the chance now. Um, I uh, was asked actually by Guso if I wanted to have someone take over my next session since it's like kind of Christmas holiday. But in fact, uh, next Thursday still works really well with my schedule. So even if you come up with a question right after the session, you will still have the chance next week if you yourself have time. So, yeah. Okay, well, um, then I will end the recording. And uh, yes, thank you guys for joining me for, for the session, as always. Very nice. Yeah, thank you for um for what you're thank teaching. You. Thank you.